Welcome to the GSMC Car Podcast, the show that takes you on a journey to the automotive world. We talk about the latest news, from new makes and models, to new technology, to all of the must-have options available. Whether you're a fan of the old classics, love the latest models and technology, or have never met a vehicle you didn't want to work on, the GSMC Car Podcast has something for every car enthusiast. And welcome to the GSMC Car Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, David Lucy Mabel. Okay, today, folks, this podcast has been a long work in the making. I had been thinking about doing a podcast about this topic for a while since my beginning with the GSMC Podcast Network back in uh, late July, early August, and the time has finally come for me to do it, especially in light of recent developments in the car world. Um, As you all know, um, electric cars are becoming a thing. Uh, electric cars have always been a thing, but they're recently uh, receiving a resurgence in popularity in recent years. Um, the reason why I want to talk about electric cars is especially after my opinion sort of shifted when I did my podcast and I did all the research uh, concerning the Hummer EV1 that's going to come out next year uh, that GMC is producing. So, yeah, this today is going to be an opinion piece, uh, mostly. Um, it's going to be about the history of electric cars, uh, the background and how they got to be the way they are today, um, where they happen, how they fell out of favor, how they've experienced the resurgence, things of that sort. Um, in segment two, we're going to talk about the impact um, on gas car sales. What will electric cars do as far as the car market goes? Um, in segment three, we're going to be talking about uh, the impact on car culture as a whole. Car tuners, uh, car enthusiasts, what should they expect from the rise of electric cars? And in segment four, as always, you will hear my personal opinion on the phenomenon of the electric car and what, what what's going on, honestly. Um, how do I feel about it? In terms of everything from styling to reliability to safety. I mean, you, you're you going to hear all of my thoughts um, in the last segment. So please stay tuned until then. Um, so let's get started. Essentially, um, electric cars have been around for nearly as long as gas cars. Uh, they were first invented in the 1880s to 1890s. It's been difficult to pinpoint an exact inventor because there's not really anybody who knows. Different sources say different things. I was doing research. I looked on a bunch of different websites, a bunch of different articles and whatnot, and each one said something slightly different. Um, some credit some inventors that created like um, electric locomotives, which aren't cars. Uh, locomotives are rail vehicles. They're like trains. But some, you know, uh, um, credited uh, the first electric vehicles to being trams. Others as being this. Others as being that. Like, let me let me just get to the point. Um, there were electric locomotives that had been invented since the 1840s. Again, not cars, trains. Um, but according to some sources, Gustave Trouvé um, invented the first electric car in 1881. However, he was unable to patent it. This could be due to the fact that um, it was based off of a tricycle that had already existed. And essentially what he did, he just slapped an electric motor onto it. Um, you know, electric motors and batteries had been in 
I guess, in the infantry of their uh, development during those time periods. And in 18, in the 1870s, 1880s, huge developments were made to make them more reliable and to make them more practical. And it was one of these practical motors he allegedly slapped onto one of these tricycles and called it a day, thus creating what I guess would technically be the very first electric car. However, some other sources say um, it was Thomas Parker, an English inventor, with um, they credited him with inventing the first production electric car in 1884. But the only documentation is a photograph from 1895, 11 years later after he was said to put that car into production. Um, this is the one that I personally believe probably has the most claim, even though it has the least amount of documentation, only as a photograph. But when you think of it, he invented this car from the ground up. He designed it and he put it into production and it was fully electric from the beginning. I, there's a difference between an electric car and something that wasn't electric that had been, being, that had been converted to electric. I mean, there, there's a difference. For example, um, kind of like with gas cars. I mean, there have been gasoline engine powered vehicles, but they were never originally cars. I mean, there was some guy in like the 1870s that had powered a, that had powered a, a, an old wagon or sorts, either a wagon or a stagecoach with an internal combustion engine, but that's not really a car. That's a wagon that's been converted to run off of an internal combustion engine. It's like the same thing with Gustave Trivet's car. I mean, it was like, it was a tricycle that was not originally meant to be an electric vehicle. It was meant to be, I think, like a pedal-powered vehicle or whatnot, and he slapped on an electric motor to it. I mean... Is it really a car? Is it really an electric car? I mean, those are those are things I don't know exactly what defines car per se, but in my own um, opinion, I would believe that in order for it to count as the first electric car, it kind of has to be. It kind of has to be designed from the ground up as an electric car, not some, you know, conversion of sorts that, oh, you know, oh, I saw this and I thought this was cool, so I'm going to convert. No, 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 it has to be designed from the ground up. But even some other sources um, credit German engineer Andreas Flocken with inventing the first electric car in 1888. As you all know, um, if you didn't know this, you should know that the electric, um, not the electric car, the uh, internal combustion uh, car, first gas car, first modern automobile. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Um, the first modern automobile was invented by Carl Benz in 1883. So if we go with what Gustave Trouvé said um, or did in 1881 that would put the electric car as being invented before the gas car and that's simply not that's not really the case I mean in my own estimation in my own opinion that's not really uh, what it is but uh, along with the invention of these cars and along with the popularity of them, um, England and France were the first countries to promote major development of electric cars. I mean, but during during this time period, England and France were devoting time and energy into developing electric cars because of frankly, they were the best car at the time period for what was needed for what needed to be done in the car world. These were the best sort of cars. Um, the golden age of electric cars came about in the early 1900s. Electric taxis uh, were already in wide use um, in London during this time period, in the early 1900s, about 120, wow, 120 years ago now. I mean, electric taxis were already in wide use over in London. Um, they were, they were, they were faster than gas cars. They were less smelly, easier to start, and didn't require gear changes. Um, not just the uh, electric taxis, but electric cars in general. I mean, when you think of it, gas cars of the time period were scary contraptions. I mean, these things were not reliable. I know you had a few standouts right out there that Cadillac. Rolls Royce, some of the really high end uh, car companies at the time were producing good, reliable cars with interchangeable parts that weren't killing their owners. But, you know, I mean, the rest of the car world wasn't very, wasn't very fortunate, wasn't as fortunate, if I could put it that way. It's, it's simply not the case that electric cars 
um, were were the way they are today. That simply wasn't the case. I mean, electric cars were the preferred alternative, as a matter of fact. The the ease of operation made them a popular choice amongst women uh, because, it, like, going back to, you know, how dangerous uh, gas cars were at the time. In order for a gas car to be started, you had to manually crank the engine before Cadillac patented the electric starter, I believe, in, like, 1910 or something. After a Cadillac backfired, and when these cars backfired, the engine crank would go the other way. Well, there was one man who was hit in the head. I guess he was bending down to crank his vehicle, and it backfired, and he was hit in the head. So the the the, the handle of the engine shifted back uh, a considerable amount very quickly, and then hit him in the head, and he ended up dying. And then Cadillac was like, absolutely not. Well, not Cadillac. That's not the name of the person. Henry M. Leland was like, I will not have my cars killing people. And so he he commissioned, you know, an electric starter to do away with the hand crank. Well, women, I mean, I'm not sexist by any means, but it was it, it was the belief of that time period that women were not physically capable of cranking an engine by hand and shifting gears and doing other sorts of, I guess, difficult activities associated with the gas car. So, you know, electric cars became a very viable option for women. And even some men drove electric cars, but were too vain to be seen in electric cars. So they even, you know, put fake radiators up at the front so they could look like gas cars instead of being electric cars. Um, so this is this was sort of how electric car culture uh, began in the U.S. I can't speak for any other parts of the world, but in the U.S. at the turn of the century, 40 percent of U.S. cars were steam powered. 38 percent were electric and only 22 percent of cars were gas powered. Now, if that doesn't show you how car culture, car world looked so much different back then. Imagine driving a steam-powered vehicle today. This is 40% of cars back then were steam-powered. 40%. Of the three different types of car, uh, um, of car propulsion systems, if I could put it that way, um, I will give you my opinions on each of them as far as their advantages and their disadvantages. Steam-powered cars disadvantage in such a way that boilers, if we're not taken care of properly, could explode. They could explode and cause severe damage to the car and uh, obviously cause bodily harm to the person operating the car and taking care of the boiler. However, steam-powered cars didn't require gear changes, and steam-powered cars, if taken care of properly, were very reliable because they were very simple. Steam technology had been around for ages at that point. So steam technology wasn't very wasn't very as complicated as a battery comp, you know batteries in electric cars or internal combustion engines in gas cars. No, a steam powered vehicle was pretty simple, pretty simple, pretty reliable, and some were a lot more advanced than some others. Like Stanley Steamer, had you you know, and Stanley Steamer, not your carpet cleaner, but Stanley Steamer, your electric, I mean, not your electric, your steam-powered car company, because that's what Stanley Steamer used to do before they started cleaning carpets. They used to manufacture steam-powered cars. Um, Stanley Steamer was your basic sort of, you know, boiler-based um, electric, uh, not electric fiddlesticks, um, steam-powered car. But then you had white. White made very good, very luxurious steam-powered automobiles that were a, a sort of different steam-powered automobile that weren't boiler-based. That It was another sort of thing that they used. I can't re quite remember the technology. There was a whole episode on Jay Leto's Garage about them, how they differed from Stanley Steamers. These had a longer amount of range, and they burned for longer, or at least they steamed for longer, if I could put it that way. However, the the other disadvantage is that steam powered cars could only really go l short distances because you needed to keep on refilling them with water and apparently on cold days they could take like 45 minutes to start i mean that's not practical that's not practical on a day if you, even if it's cold even if it's hot you need to be able to hop in your car and drive away gas cars were cheaper than electric cars 
They were cheaper than electric cars. However, gas cars had a reputation for unreliability at the time because all those moving parts, everything from pistons to crankshafts to transmissions, all that other foolishness, I mean, all that stuff is just stuff to break. And especially in the early days where these things are still experimental, it's not like you could just go to your local Firestone and then get your car, you know, oil changed. Or if you didn't know what you were doing to own a, a, a gas car, you really couldn't. Because in the early days, you sort of had to kind of be your own mechanic. Unless you were rich enough to afford a mechanic. Or you had to wait until, you know, electric cars became more, or not electric cars, gas cars became more prevalent. So, you know, mechanic shops and an infrastructure around that could actually exist. And so these were things, these were things that were, were difficult, were difficult to deal with when it came to gas cars. Um, electric cars, on the other hand, electric cars um, ran for longer than steam cars. They burned cleaner. They didn't burn at all. I mean, steam cars had white steam coming out of them, hence the name. And then gas cars were smelly and they smoked and they belched gas and other sorts of foolishness. But electric cars were clean. There was no smoke, they were quiet, and they were very safe compared to all those other cars. They weren't prone to boiler explosions like steam cars, and they weren't prone to constant breakdowns because of one system or another as a, a gas car. So for the time period, electric cars were faster than the other cars, even though their range wasn't as good as gas cars. But in those days, there wasn't an infrastructure to support long road trips anyway. I mean, most people who own cars were the wealthier people who drove their cars around in the city. And that's basically what um, electric cars were, were good for. So uh, essentially, um, what ended up happening was gas cars ended up uh, taking over electric cars as technology advanced. Um, electric car sales actually peaked in the 1910s. And after that, they steadily declined once gas cars became more efficient, more reliable, cleaner, had better range, and became cheaper and cheaper to operate. Electric cars had soon begun to fall out of favor. And that makes sense. So uh, please stay tuned for the next uh, segment of the podcast in which I'm going to be talking about um, electric cars impact on gas car sales uh, right now in the world. So please stay tuned. Are you a business owner? someone interested in the latest news that might affect your business? Then check out the GSMC Business News Podcast, a show dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning business, technology, and the stock market. Get a head start on the day as we keep you updated on the latest goings on on Wall Street, money, jobs, and technology. The GSMC Business News Podcast has you covered. All right. Uh, welcome back, wonderful car people. Hope you enjoyed the uh, commercial break there. So, yeah, um, in the last segment, we discussed uh, basically the history behind electric cars. And this is where the sort of opinion piece of the of the podcast starts. Um, I'm going to give you my opinion on several aspects of car culture. Um, as far as electric cars go and what potential impact they may have. Some positive impacts, some negative impacts, because obviously whenever something new comes out, there are pros and there are cons, and there are people who are excited about it, and there are people who are kind of upset about it. And this is something we've seen with electric cars recently. So um, let me talk first about the impact, or at least my opinion, of the impact of electric cars on gas car sales. Um... As more and more electric cars are produced by large established companies, gas cars will eventually fall out of favor. Now, I used to be the sort of purist that was like, ah, oh, nah, gas cars are always going to be a thing. Electric cars will never take over. They're unreliable. They're unsafe, blah, 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 nah, nah, nah. 
And then I actually started seeing some of the electric cars that were coming out, some of the numbers that these things promised, uh, some of the reactions that they're getting. And frankly, I started seeing more and more electric cars. Now I can say with great confidence, every single day I go out, I see an electric car, a fully electric car. I mean, I remember the first time I saw a Tesla back in like 2013 or 2014 or something like that. I was amazed. I saw it. I was like, whoa, that's a Tesla Model S. Nowadays, Tesla Model S is old news. And when I talk about old news, I'm talking about really old news. Nobody cares about the Tesla Model S anymore. And that's sort of a good thing, the fact that nobody cares about electric vehicles. And it's not that nobody cares, it's that nobody's hyped about electric vehicles anymore. Because electric vehicles, guess what? Have become part of normal life. They're becoming more and more normal as the days go by. Now, especially with the advent of the Tesla Model 3, Electric vehicles are becoming more and more, not only reliable, but electric vehicles are also becoming more and more, um, how does one explain, oh dear, they're becoming more and more popular, more and more normal, more and more commonplace is what I'm trying to say. They're, they're becoming more and more attainable as well. I know friends of mine. Who I'm I'm a broke grad school student just out of college, just out of undergrad. I know friends of mine who are very much in the same lot in life as me, who are thinking about purchasing Teslas in the near future. I mean, this is how attainable they become. Like a person who's young, a starting professional in the in the professional world can get to the point where they can buy a Tesla, they can buy an electric car. There was a time that that's, that was not possible for the longest time. And it's the first time within our lifetimes that this has happened. Because nearly everybody alive on Earth today was not alive during the golden age of electric cars in the early 1900s, the early 1910s. And if those people are still alive, they sure as heck aren't driving. So nobody can tell you, oh, my first car was an electric car. No, I mean, those people, those people, first of all, would have been the richest of the rich to be able to, to be able to afford electric cars. And not only that, they would have to be, oh, born in like the 1870s in order to amass that much wealth by the time the 1890s and the 1900s and the 1910s came around where they would be, oh, 20, 30, 40 years old in order for them to amass that much wealth in order to buy an electric car. Those people would be 140-something years old today. So nobody really remembers the time in which electric cars were practical, in which electric cars were even an option. So now that they're experiencing a resurgence, people are interested. People are interested, and people are beginning to buy them. The people who have them love them. They, they... They use them normally like you would normally use a car. I mean, of course, there are still limitations as technology has not fully progressed yet. They haven't come to their most perfect form, if I could put it that way. But they'll get more and more perfect as the days go by. So, um, yeah, gas cars will eventually fall out of favor, in my opinion. This is a new opinion for me. This is not something that I like to admit because I'm a car enthusiast. I am a car purist. I love my gasoline cars. But I also have to concede to the fact that, hey, you know, they they may not be a thing so much anymore. And I'm talking about, oh, God gracious, probably within my lifetime. Like, I'm only 22 years old going to turn 23 next month. I've got a good 50, 60 years left of life left worth living. And heck, if I live to be the age of my great-grandmother and I die at 110, I still got about 90 years left. So, like, you know, I'm, I'm just saying, I, I might see a point where gas cars are no longer practical, gas cars are no longer the norm. Especially when you consider that the population of the Earth is increasing 
as the population of the earth is increasing, fossil fuels are going to be used more and more. Fossil fuels are going to be used more and more. Global warming is going to be a thing. We're going to have more natural disasters. I mean, people are going to have to get to a point where the most developed countries on earth are going to have to put a stop to it or be like, look, we are killing the planet. It's getting to the point where the planet is on life support. If we don't do something big, we're going to have a big problem. And that's why it's beginning to get to the point where, you know, some countries are even pledging that they're going to go fully electric on their cars by like 2030 or something. That's, you know, that's that's only 10 years away. I mean, that that's, you know, the days of the internal combustion engine in the modern automobile are numbered. And they might be coming to an end more than we would like to admit as car purists. Um, moving on for the average person, a non car enthusiast, electric cars are just better for them. Like I hate to admit this, but it really is. I mean, they're more reliable. They're more reliable. Of course, I've only seen one Tesla with 454,000 miles on it. That was a Tesla Model S. I think it was like a 2012 model or something. However, when you look at it, Electric cars have so much less moving parts than gas cars. I mean, you all know about the, you know, the issues I've had with my good old 17-year-old Buick out there, Betty Love. And Betty, she's old. She's a gas-powered vehicle just like most cars on the road today. There are certain components that just go bad. I just had lower intake and upper intake manifold gaskets changed. That was, you know, a 300 something dollar job, plus the fact that I need my mass airflow sensor change too. These are not things I would have to worry about if I had an electric car. There is no mass airflow sensor because there is no engine that needs air. There is no lower or upper intake manifold gas because once again, there is no engine that needs air. There is no vacuum leak in the engine of a, of a electric car because there is no engine. So there is no need for air to pass through. There are no vacuum leaks. There will be no seals. There will be nothing of that sort. You don't have to worry about head gaskets. You don't have to worry about your water pump failing. You don't have to worry about power steering. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. I mean, when you really think of it, a car is such a complex machine and an electric car is taking that complexity making it simpler and achieving the same effect for the average person that's going to be perfect for them yes gas prices are falling currently but gas prices are super fickle gas prices could skyrocket through the roof next thing we know we don't know the average person is going to be like uh you know what look I only need a car to get me from point A to point B. And if my point A happens to be 20 miles away from my point B, I don't need a gas car anymore. I can just get myself an electric car, save money and gas, help the environment. And plus, it's, you know, right now it's cool to have an electric car. Even though they're becoming more and more common, it's still pretty cool to have an electric car. The only thing you would have to worry so much about it is when it does finally break or when it needs routine service, you can't really sort of take it to your regular old mechanic because they haven't been trained in electric cars because electric cars are not as common yet. But even then, there's ways around that. You could foot the extra bill and go to the dealer and have them take care of it. Yeah, they're going to cut your throat, but when you think you're not spending money on gas, you're not spending money on oil changes, you're not spending money on all that other foolishness, I mean, yeah, you might go to the dealer once a year and spend $1,000 in one setting, but when you think of it, a gas car is a lot more expensive over a year than just $1,000 because you have to constantly be putting gas, you have to be constantly changing your oil, you have to be constantly doing this, you have to be constantly doing that. You have to, There's a lot of systems that need to be maintained in a gas car. Electric car doesn't have to do that. So the, 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 the amount of money that you're going to spend over the course of a year of ownership of a gas car, you know, might be worth putting into an electric car in one setting if you need like a battery pack to be changed or something or one of your motors fails and you need it to be replaced. I mean, that's something that's something to consider. And I believe governments will begin to encourage people to switch 
to electric in order to save the environment. And there could be another cash for clunkers, this time for gas cars in general. Um, electric cars will gain popularity in urbanized areas of the world first. That's what I truly believe. In Europe, you're going to see electric cars before you see them here in the United States. In Japan, South Korea, those highly urbanized, very wealthy East Asian countries, you're going to see them first before you see them in the United States. In certain cities of the United States, you're going to see them first. Um, the reason why I say that is because Europeans... They have a much more efficient way of uh, passing government demands, if you will. Americans are all about freedom. Americans don't like big government. Americans this, Americans that. Like, I'm not going to get into politics, but I, I'm going somewhere with this. When you take a mentality like that and the government tries to persuade people to no longer buy gas cars, that's not going to go over well with American people who love their freedom, who love their gas cars, the big guzzling, you know, diesel trucks. I mean, they are not, that's not going to go over very well. So before the United States fully adopts electric cars, the technology might be there and the technology might be used, but before it's fully adopted, the government is going to not have to force people, but the government is going to have to give them an incentive to do it. That's how it's going to work. And before anything like that happens, it's going to be a while in the United States. I believe California, that has always been stringent on environmental regulations when it comes to cars, will be the first to demand that electric cars be sold in California and everybody switch to electric. I believe California will be the first. California is highly urbanized. California has a huge population, the largest population of any state. And there are already stringent regulations on cars in California as it is. I believe places like New York City will get to a point where their taxis will become electric. That would clear up a huge smog problem in the, in the city eventually. You're already seeing buses that are not powered by traditional fuel sources. I believe city buses will get to the point where they're electric. I believe so many different sort of systems that we take for granted will be electric. I mean, look at Japan. Japan, their, their, their entire Shinkansen, which is their high-speed bullet train, is all electric. All electric. If they could do that and make that thing go like 250, 300 miles per hour, they could take that same sort of technology and apply it to a car. In Japan, where car ownership is not even as prevalent here in the United States, and Japanese people don't drive their cars very fast and they don't drive their cars for very long and they don't drive them very much at all, frankly. Electric cars are going to become a very viable option over there. And ironically, I spent a total of four months in Japan. I don't recall ever seeing an electric car in Japan. I don't know if the people that I was around, that were, that I were, that I was, I, I don't know, grammar right now, but... I don't know if the places I, I, I visited, I don't know if the electric cars had just not gotten there yet and hadn't gained a body, but I didn't see an electric car at all. But then again, goodness, there's a lot of cars that over there that were super fuel efficient anyway, the little K cars that were lightweight cars. But I can totally see electric cars becoming more and more viable, more and more, oh dear, how would I put it? More and more popular more and more attainable, more and more practical to own in large urbanized areas, such as the country of Japan, such as the country of South Korea, such as the state of California, such as other sorts of European cities. Um, London, for example, you heard about them and their electric taxis back in the 1910s. I mean, like, you, you, you hear about these European countries and that what, str what strives they are making towards in renewable energy and all sorts of other things of that sort. I mean, those are the sorts of countries that are going to have electric cars, that are going to sell them, and that are going to eventually, within the near future, 10, 20, 30 years, are going to be surpassing gas cars because of those people's mentality. Here in America, it's going to take longer. Not to say that the technology doesn't exist, but it is just to say that people are going to be more willing to switch if the government gives them an incentive instead of forcing them to. Now, here's what I mean by an incentive. 
the government has always been trying to control automobiles control automobile ownership, control what sorts of automobiles are being produced. That's why there's so many government regulations when it comes to cars. There was a time that they were going to charge car companies gas guzzler taxes if their cars were terribly inefficient. And you got to the point where all of these old inefficient cars, especially from the 70s, were bought by the government in a program called Cash for Clunkers. They took these cars and they paid their owners cash for them as an incentive for them to get rid of their old gas guzzling cars in order to switch to more fuel efficient cars right around, you know, I believe cash for clunkers was in like the 80s to the 90s or something like that. During that time period, there were a lot of cars that were crushed by the government because they were paid for by their owners or their owners were paid by the government to give their cars over to a junkyard to have them crushed because they were slow and inefficient and they guzzled too much gas and the price of gas was going up steadily and environmental regulations these cars were not environmentally friendly because these were the days before smog you know emission standards and other sorts of that stuff so i believe there will be eventually a cash for clunkers not for electric cars but for old gas cars that will be bought by the government in order to crush them and then pay the owners you know as like sort of a thing like, hey, you're going to take this money now and you're going to go invest it towards an electric car. I feel like that's how they're going to be able to get a lot of people. Of course, they're still going to have a few holdouts, but I think it's going to get to a point where there's going to be a cash for clunkers for gas cars incentivizing people to buy electric cars. Um, In the rural areas, I don't quite see electric cars going you know, surpassing gas cars just yet because the technology is just still not there yet. I mean, most electric cars don't offer 350 miles worth of range. Um, Most take a long time to charge. And most are not really rugged off-road vehicles that a lot of these people need in these these rural areas. So that's something to consider as well. Uh, So please stay tuned for the next segment of the podcast in which I'm going to be talking about um, the impact on car tuner culture, uh, car enthusiasts, essentially, how they will, you know, take the impact of the uh, electric car phenomenon, the rise of electric cars. So please stay tuned after the break. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Right. Welcome back, car people. So um, in the last segment, you heard me talk about the impact on the car sales and the car market here in the United States. Now, let's talk about the impact on car culture. Now, this is something um, that my friend Grant and I were talking about. Uh, Grant is my best friend. Uh, Grant and I both are car enthusiasts, albeit car enthusiasts of a very different breed, but both are car enthusiasts, and we've been friends, best friends since like sixth grade. I've known Grant forever. Grant's like my brother. And Grant and I are always discussing cars and new car trends and other sorts of that thing. Uh, Grant texted me. 
And Grant was like, yeah, dude, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous that these electric cars these days are coming from the factory with like a thousand horsepower and zero to 60 times in three seconds. He's like, you know, it makes it look like eventually when these cars become more normal, if your car makes less than a thousand horsepower, you look like a chump. And that's what gave me the idea to do this podcast. I was like, oh my gosh, exactly. I'm going to talk about the impact of electric cars on the car culture. Not just the car market, but the car culture as well. Because that's a huge thing. Car culture is a huge thing. Racing is a huge thing. Um, Tuning cars is a huge thing. There are companies that make millions of dollars a year selling performance parts to people who drive Mustangs, to people who drive Camaros, to people who drive sports cars. There are companies who spend millions of dollars restoring old classic cars. There are companies who who, who make millions of dollars um, tuning cars for people. There are companies that make millions of dollars dyno tuning. I mean, there's a whole industry behind modifying cars for their owners. Now, think about that. Electric cars don't really have that sort of tunability, if I may, if I may, you know, um, if I may coin that term tunability. They don't have that sort of tunability. It's not like you're going to get to a point where you're going to be able to take your gas, your, your, your electric car to ZZP performance that provides performance for uh, 3,800 uh, performance parts for Buick 3,800 engines. You're not going to be able to take them there and be like, yeah, I want a new uh, cold air intake on my electric car. No, nah. that's not going to happen. They'll be like, no, nah, dude, that's not a thing. You know, there are no cold air intakes for uh, electric cars because they don't have engines. Like, granted, I believe there will be a point where electric cars are going to be able to be tuned in their own way. But as far as the possibilities go, there are not nearly as many possibilities of tuning with electric cars as there are with gas cars. I mean, tuning in electric cars, I believe, will end up looking very, very different. And it might need a computer programmer to tune an electric car to make it the performance that you want it to be. Because even gas cars, there is a computer component to cars, all in all cars nowadays. I mean, even in my 2004 car, if I wanted to tune it, I could get the PCM change, like the, 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 um, the primary control module or the EC and the electronic control module, point is something with the computer of the car, I would have to get it changed in order for me to tune my car to higher performance. So even my gas car has an electrical component to it that needs someone who's, you know, versed in computers, who's versed in car um, computers and whatnot to do that. I believe you'll get to a point where instead of going to a mechanic and having them slap off the exhaust or removing your catalytic converters, which is illegal in some places, not in Florida, though. Um, but if you want to do all of that, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to have to go to like a computer programmer, like a car computer programmer and have them program the car so they can tune the engine or not the engine, the motors in such a way so that they can either produce more electricity or they can spin faster and cause your car to go faster. I mean, that's. That's basically where I believe we're going to get as far as car tuning culture. Um, car tuners modify transmissions, engines, and other major components to build more power into their cars. Electric cars don't offer that sort of tunability. Higher voltage batteries perhaps can be swapped in, but other sorts of components simply don't exist, so they can't be modified. I can't get an exhaust kit that's going to allow my car to breathe better if I have an electric car that doesn't have an engine that doesn't produce gases that need to be exhausted. You, you see you see what the problem is now. And not so much the problem, but you see what the 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 issue that so many car enthusiasts have with the with the rise of electric cars. You're gonna get to the point where, you know, these people are gonna go to the drag strip. They're gonna have you know, their modified 1996 Toyota Supra with the 2JZ engine slapped on a huge old big old a, a, a turbo on there and put drag tires, you know, installed the parachutes, did the whole nine yards. And you're going to have a stock Tesla Model 3 
which is a cheap electric car for like 30,000 bucks. And this other person is like sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 deep into their car, the initial investment and all the modifications. And then you're going to get beat at the drag strip. Like, I'm not one for fragile masculinity. I'm not one for pride and boasting and all those sort of, but man, I would be peeved. Like, I would be upset that, look, I just spent all this money in my car only to go to the drag strip and be beat by stock Tesla Model 3. Or something even more ludicrous, a stock Hummer EV1. Because it has a thousand horsepower, three motors, and zero to 60 in three seconds. I might be making zero to 60 in four seconds. And then that another thing. That you know, Toyota, mythical Toyota Supra that I'm talking about has a transmission that needs to be shifted. The Hummer EV, the, 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 the Tesla doesn't have a transmission. So that's instant torque. Instant. You put your accelerator pedal, I can't call it a gas pedal because the car doesn't use gas, but you put your accelerator pedal car, it just goes. It go. It doesn't even hesitate. You don't have to shift through gears. You don't have to wait for the engine to warm up. You don't have to do all that. You just go. No matter how built your com internal combustion car is, electric cars have gotten to the point where they are objectively better in performance as far as, you know, zero to 60 times acceleration and power than, you know, equivalent, you know, price range gas cars. I mean, that's, that's kind of putting, that's kind of putting tuner culture at like a loss here. Like what's going to happen? What's going to happen to tuner culture once most people start driving electric cars and you will get people who would have been car enthusiasts who never owned a gas car will never become car enthusiasts because now they own an electric car or at least maybe not car enthusiasts, but car tuners. I mean, these car companies that these car part companies that provide um, that provide performance parts, it might be who of them to see what they can do to an electric car, to see what they can do to an electric car and to see if it would be possible for them to sell tuner parts for electric cars as well. For the people, for like the modern sort of car tuner that, you know, of my children's generation, when I'm like 40, 50, and my children, however old they will be, I don't have children currently, but, you know, however old they will be, so they can start driving, if they are car enthusiasts as well, you know, I might see in their culture, as they grow up with electric cars, they might find technology that's going to allow them to tune their own car with a computer or with an app that you can download from the company. Or they might be able to take it somewhere where it can get tuned, a special electric car tuning shop. I mean, the possibilities are endless, but I'm just saying as far as traditional internal combustion car, um, gas powered car, tuner culture, I mean, that's, that's going to be difficult. That's going to be difficult for it to continue unadulterated, if I could put it that way, uninterrupted. It's going to be difficult for it to continue. Um... Just like when cars overtook horses as the main mode of transportation, horse ownership was limited to mostly people who were enthusiasts and people who can afford horses. I know where I'm going with this. Gas cars, in my opinion, will be the same way. Gas cars are going to get to the point where the only people who own gas cars are the enthusiasts. Gas cars are going to get to the point where where not only the people who own gas cars are enthusiasts, but the people who keep them are going to be, you know, taking them to car shows, just like horse owners take horses to horse shows. People are going to be racing them just like people already race cars or people already race horses. People are going to be racing internal combustion engines. People are going to be modifying them, sort of like how people already breed horses so they can get the best sort of horse. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's going to be in that same vein. They're going to have a dedication to internal combustion engines and their cars, just like people have a devotion to horses. Horses are still a booming industry, but the, the industry has changed completely. Instead of you getting your regular quarter horse for you to pull your, you know, cart. Nah, you're going to get a horse nowadays. Because a horse is an investment. You take it to a horse show. 
You can race it if it's a racehorse. There are so many things a horse can do nowadays that's worth all the money that you spend on the horse as an initial investment. There will be there to there will get to a point where gas cars will be the same way. You can still purchase a brand new gas car and you can still drive it. You can still use it. It's like you could still ride a horse on the road today. I mean, like it's probably not recommended, but you could still do it. You will be able to still buy a new gas car. And what will end up happening is the fact that your gas car is a specialty item. It's a specialty item not meant to be used every day, only meant to be used sparingly, only meant to be used on certain occasions to go to car shows, to go to other things. That's how gas cars might end up being. Because like I said, for the average consumer, electric cars are already becoming attainable and they're already becoming practical. And they're already becoming, you know, common enough that if they have a problem, they can take it somewhere to be fixed. It's not like this is some exclusive car that nobody has ever heard of. There's going to be somewhere out there to be able to do your scheduled maintenance and your electric cars, whatever that may be. I don't know what they could be because they don't get oil changes because they don't have engines. But you just just consider it that way. Consider it that way. That's how internal combustion engines will be at some point. They will be enthusiast items. I Just let me reiterate this. Electric cars with 1,000 plus horsepower in zero to 60 times of three seconds sort of cheapen the significance of horsepower and zero to 60 times. Those numbers will eventually become the new normal. You will get to a point where zero to 60 in three seconds is just normal. Right now, zero to 60 in about six to seven seconds is what a normal car does. Maybe eight seconds if your car is a bit older. Mine right now does zero to 60 in 7.8 seconds. That's real slow compared to electric cars. And it's real slow compared to enthusiast cars. So like, you know, it will eventually get to the point where electric cars zero to 60 times are the new normal. That's what people see. That's what people expect. Then you're going to get your whole horsepower community, your whole car uh, community is going to get all up in arms about that because they'll be like, well, that's not fair. You didn't build your car. You bought it because you have a lot of money. I built my car. Like my friend Grant, he's got this Mustang that puts out like 500 horsepower to the wheels. I mean, he built that from stock. He built it. He spent the money. He did some of the work himself, other work that he couldn't do. He had to install that local mechanic shop. But Grant did all of that for his car. And his car, as a result today, is absolutely wonderful. He loves it. But if I were to go get a Tesla Model 3 even, or wait till next year and get a Hummer EV1 and I go and race Grant, I'm undoubtedly going to beat him. And I spent just on the stock car. I didn't do anything to modify the car. That's kind of why it's frustrating because you're going to get to a point that no matter what you do, your car will never be as fast as an electric car. It will never be as, I guess, viable as an electric or not viable, but it will never be, you know, it will never be as high performance as an electric car. And that's kind of frustrating to some people. And it's sort of sad because I truly believe that cartooning is an art form. It's an art form that I don't believe will die, but I believe the art form is going to, you know, take a back step. I believe the art form is going to take a back step. Um, it's not going to be as prevalent as it is now. It will still exist. The art form will still exist, but it's not going to be as prevalent as it is now. Um, so please stay tuned for the next segment in which I talk about my personal opinion on car electric cars and what the impact they're going to have and other sorts of things. So uh, please stay tuned. Do you work in the world of marketing and advertising? Are you a media buyer or the owner of an agency? Have you been looking for a podcast to help stay on top of all the goings on of those worlds? The GSMC Marketing News Podcast is dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning marketing and advertising. Get the latest marketing news from what major businesses have planned for the coming year to the newest trends in advertising from podcasts, digital and streaming to the old standbys of radio, television and billboards. The GSMC Marketing News Podcast has you covered whether you're a marketing agent or a business trying to expand your brand.
Okay, welcome back, car people. Um, in this last segment of this podcast, we are going to be discussing my thoughts on electric cars. What are my honest feelings about electric cars? I'm going to tell you what I honestly feel. I honestly feel that electric cars are going to overtake gas cars. And I honestly feel that car ownership will become less special. Yeah. I think it's become less special. Because along with the advent of electric cars that are highway capable, you're going to get a lot of technology that goes with those cars. Not only are you going to get a lot of technology, there are a lot of things you're going to miss out on being able to do. Everybody remembers their first car. Everybody remembers their first time behind the wheel. Everybody remembers all of that. With electric cars, I mean, you're not going to have those sort of stories where, oh, yeah, my car broke down the first time I got into, you know, I, I got my car broke down. Not, of course, those are not good things that you want to happen to, but it's going to become less special, especially when you're going to have kids these days driving with cars that have backup cameras. You're going to be having kids these days that are driving with cars that have lane keep assist. You're going to have kids these days driving cars that have super cruise and other sorts of things that it's not going to be, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same. It's going to be, you know, less and less driver input is going to be needed when you're driving those cars because you're going to have not only the fact that they're electric cars and there are certain things that they're never going to need to know how to do. They're never going to need to know how to change their oil. They're never going to need to know what the what the importance of regular maintenance is on those cars because electric cars are not going to need all of that foolishness that gas cars uh, have. They're, got, they're, gonna, they're, they're, they're not going to know certain things. It's not going to be special. It's not going to be special. Less and less input, meaning that they're going to just do the bare minimum. Cars will increasingly become more and more a point A to point B thing instead of a special thing that, you know, garners a community around it. A car ownership will inevitably become less special. Because, let's be honest, just like the majority of cars today aren't your fast, I don't know, Cadillac CTSVs or aren't your awesome off-roaders like the Ford Bronco. Your average cars get you from point A to point B. They're like your Chevy Malibu. Boring, unassuming, not really that exciting. And not really that luxurious either. It's just your regular everyday car. Now imagine that, but with electric cars. Even though the Hummer EV1 is an awesome electric car that's going to come out next year. That's not what most electric cars are going to be like. Most electric cars are going to be boring. Most electric cars are not going to be that special. Most electric cars are going to be like, okay, it's point A to point B. That's all I do. Don't ask me to do anything else. Don't race me. Don't drive me fast. Don't do this. Don't do that. Just, just do it. It felt so... It would feel so impersonal, especially when I believe a car is an extension of one's personality. I mean, yeah, that's that's what I believe it's going to be. Let's talk about in terms of styling. I don't like how most electric cars are styled, especially Teslas. I think the only attractive Tesla out there is the Tesla Model S. The Tesla Model 3 looks like a frog. The Tesla Model Y looks like an obese frog. And the Tesla Model X looks like an egg on wheels. The Nissan Leaf also looks like an egg on wheels. They all have that same basic sort of shape so they can maximize their efficiency by having, a, you know, um, what's it called? Aerodynamic uh, shapes and whatnot, less of a drag coefficient, other sorts of foolishness of that sort. I mean, th I'm simply not into all of that. It's, it's not nice. 
most electric cars are shaped the same way. They've got this sort of teardrop shape that allows them to slip through the air better. I mean, yes, it's modern. Yes, it's functional. Yes, it's practical, but it's just not pretty. I mean, nobody's going to tell you a Tesla Model 3 is pretty. Tesla Model 3 ain't pretty. Cadillac CTSV is pretty. Tesla Model 3 ain't pretty. Doesn't have a grill. Looks like a frog. Tesla Model Y looks like an overgrown frog. Tesla Model X looks like an egg. On You're like, hey, these things ain't that pretty. They're not that great. As far as design and styling goes. I mean, granted, there's no reason to put a grill on a car that doesn't have an engine. But I'd like to think of it that they can just put like a plastic metal chrome applique on the front of the car that makes it look more normal, especially for people like me who like the way their cars look. That's another thing. Car culture is going to become less special, just like I had just said, because a styling. Man, anybody who's a car enthusiast knows how visually beautiful a car could be. I don't anticipate that happening to electric cars anytime soon. There are some regular everyday gas cars that were produced that are absolutely gorgeous. I mean, I can't name off of the top of my head right now, but I can tell you I know for a fact that there are. So why do, you know, electric cars have to look that boring? Why do they have to look so silly? Like why? That's something I've never been able to understand. Practicality. I will say, electric cars are going to become more practical than gas cars. They're going to become more practical. And not in terms of range, in terms of overall practicality. You're not going to need to stop by a gas station all the time and spend the money. However, when you do charge your car, it's going to take a while to charge compared to, you know, 10 minutes at a gas pump to fill up your tank. Even if it takes 10 minutes, it might not even take 10 minutes. So, like, you know, there are pros and cons as far as practicality goes. But I feel like as the range gets longer, people are going to be more used to waiting a little bit for your car to charge up fully for you to get back on the road again. They're going to start budgeting that time for charging into their road trips. They're going to start doing things like that. And that's what I truly believe is going to end up happening. I believe that it's going to end up getting to the point where people are going to get used to electric cars and just put up with the small inconveniences for the greater good of not only the society, the environment, and frankly, for the greater good of their bank accounts because they're not going to need to spend nearly as much money to take care of those cars as someone with a gas car would. So moving on. Practical, uh, no, not practical. We are just spoke about practicality. Safety. Ah, here's where my biggest gripe with electrical cars was, was their safety. When you get into a front end collision in a car with a front motor, which is most cars, not all, some cars have their engines in the back, some have their engines middle of the car behind or in front of one of the axles behind the front axle in front of the rear axle if your engine is mounted in one of those two locations it is a mid-engine car but most cars i'm talking about your regular honda accords and whatnot have their engines up front when you get into a head-on collision your engine block absorbs much of the impact what will you do when you don't have an engine block anymore, and that's just the cargo area that can be easily folded in on itself. How are you going to keep your passengers safe? That's another thing. Let's say your car gets, you know, severely mangled. And there's live wires running through the car and they need to save you. How are they going to save you? I've heard about you know, electric car crashes. I don't know if this is true, but I've heard about electric car crashes in which they couldn't use like the jaws of life on them because the jaws of life obviously are metal. And because this thing's metal, it conducts electricity and there's electricity running through the car, even though it's been damaged. I mean, these are things that are going to make 
you know, rescue from car accidents a bit more complicated when you know that you can't touch the car because there's live electricity running through it. And, you know, I don't know if any cars have a su- shut-off switch that if you get into an accident, it automatically blows off your doors and, you know, you can get out. Or if it has another safety feature. Not that I know of. So, I mean, safety is a thing. Safety not only in crashes, but safety in water. I mean, are electric cars going to be able to drive on flooded roads? Will they be able to? There's so many things that still need to be answered. Do I believe they will answer them eventually? Sure, I will. But there are lots of things that need to be answered. I mean... The, 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 um, let's see, after reliability, we had the lasting impact. I already believe that government is going to begin to pay people to get rid of their gas cars so they can buy electric cars. I already believe that. You're going to see more and more gas cars. And, you know, there's a couple of people that I know, I mean, not more and more gas cars, more and more electric cars. There's a couple of people that I know that as soon as electric cars become more available, they're going to go out and buy one. You're going to get all those people who are going to go and buy one. And you know what? Maybe it's it's worth it. Maybe it's not worth it. But you're going to end up having to, you know, get rid of some things. I mean, you might have to get rid of your gas car in order for you to get an electric car. The government might be like, okay, you know what? Give me your car. I'll do whatever the heck I want with it. Here's some money. Go put it towards an electric car. Save the environment. Goodbye. I mean, that's probably what it's going to end up being like. And I don't want it to be that way, but that's probably what it's going to end up being like. Um, What I predict will happen. Now, this I'm going to focus on Tesla a little bit. Considering how much Chrysler's floundering right now, Tesla's also an American company, even though Elon Musk is not American, but it's an American-based company. So Tesla's are American cars. What I believe will end up happening, I believe Tesla will end up becoming a large automaker in the United States. I used to say that Tesla was going to go out of business once the other car companies begin to take hold of electric cars. That still might happen, but I don't think so. I think Tesla is going to become one of the big automakers. Tesla is going to become like, oh, Ford is going to become like Chrysler. It's going to become like uh, GM. I believe Tesla is going to be like the big four. And as Chrysler begins to dwindle and dwindle, I believe Chrysler itself as a mark is going to go away. I believe Chrysler itself as a mark is going to go away. Dodge and Jeep might merge, honestly. And I believe that that Dodge Jeep merger might be sold to another company and Fiat Chrysler is just going to go under because they don't have any electric cars and time is frankly running out for them economically. If we have another economic you know, downturn or recession, especially with this coronavirus foolishness going on, I mean, like uh, Chrysler might not make it. Chrysler's on life support. Like we, Chrysler's on death watch. We are, we are waiting for the phone call that Chrysler is, you know, you know, taking their last breath and is over in the glory land now. I mean, Chrysler, Chrysler ain't going to last much longer. I believe Tesla as an electric car company will take the place of Chrysler. That's what I believe. Tesla is doing a lot better than Chrysler right now. And I believe you're going to get to a point where there's going to be bitter competition, <clears throat> pardon, bitter competition between um, gas-powered cars and electric-powered cars, or at least gas-powered car companies and electric car, car companies. You will get the car, the car companies that produce gas cars are going to start producing electric cars, and then then they're going to start having a bit of rivalry, especially between them and Tesla. That's when I believe Tesla, even though it might become larger than it is now, that's when I believe Tesla, if it's going to have a problem, is going to have a problem then, but I don't think it's going to have a problem. I think Tesla is going to, going to become a large car company. And so, yeah, there you have it. I mean, I have expressed how I feel about electric cars and the impact they're going to have on our culture. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a reality, and I'm glad I was able to do this opinion piece because I think I think this is something that a lot of people are wondering about. 
uh, what's going to happen with electric cars? What's going to happen to gas cars? Is gas going to go out? Am I still going to be able to drive my gas car? I mean, you might get to a point where you sell your gas car to the government. They give you money for it. And then you go and buy yourself an electric car. You might get to that point. Because if you continue to own your gas car, it might be widely impractical for you or the government might tax you as as a way to deter you from driving a gas car. So there you have it. Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the GSMC Car Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. If you like this, please leave us a review on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you can find us. Listen to us and let your friends know about us. And thank you and have a good night. You've been listening to the GSMC Car Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type GSMC into your favorite podcast app to find all of the shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, from business news to weird news. Please subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed today's episode.